everybody, we're going to get started for the sake of time. And uh, there's no poll. I might be asking you questions, but if you could all pull out your eye clicker now and just click it so we, uh, we can record your presence. Happy almost holiday. Uh, just as a reminder, on Monday, we're going to have uh, multiple lecturers and also uh, Divest Princeton coming, and we're going to have a, a kind of larger discussion about divestment. So uh, that should be pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to that. So hopefully we'll see you all in class on Monday. Uh, today, I'm going to try to give an overview, without getting too in the weeds, um, about several different narratives that we could think of in terms of financing a just energy transition. So we know through all the stuff that we've been talking about in class that the IPCC has warned that in order to keep warming under 1.5 degrees, we have to get this global emissions cut to zero, right? the net zero goal by 2050. And we've been discussing in class multiple ways of how to best decarbonize the energy system. And this conversation, as you might have noted, has been including socioeconomic challenges that we have to face that are necessary to face in order to get to net zero. And so today I want to examine really three, but looking at two sort of competing uh, climate change mitigation narratives that have emerged on this like socioeconomic task front. Uh, and that these two narratives tend to break with traditional market-based environmental policies. And so um, we have this aim, I think, today to try to just see that there are multiple alternatives that have been put forward, both by grassroots movements and on policy fronts. And then as the sort of you know, philosophical emphasis that I can bring to play, uh, we can look at some moral arguments that are sort of entailed and, and different kinds of uh, moral questions that arise in light of these different narratives. So um, I want to look, whoop, did I skip here? So this is the task for today. And this slide can be used as a reference point for questions when studying for this particular portion for the exam. So we're looking at what kind of socioeconomic changes are going to be necessary to get to net zero, and also raising questions of how we can evaluate climate change mitigation narratives that break with those traditional market-based environmental policies that I was mentioning. So some of the questions we're going to canvas today that I hope to get to are how we should understand these various frameworks, so trying to get you to understand what their basic commitments are and what their central claims are, and therefore what are some of the sort of underlying moral justifications for those claims. What are some advantages and some maybe disadvantages or critiques for these different kinds of frameworks? Are there any tensions between them? So where do they diverge or where are there points of disagreement? And do they have points of overlap or the possibility for convergence? So we're going to look at some arguments that say that these two frameworks are not as incompatible as they're commonly understood. And then I want to consider other kinds of uh, you know, moral considerations that come up that are involved in these narratives and to see if we even have an alternative beyond them. So, the two central narratives we're going to be talking about and looking at are green growth and degrowth. But towards the end, I'm going to put forward some arguments by folks um, that kind of are proponents of maybe an agrowth model. So this is going to incorporate lots of elements into the reading and also be able to have a discussion of the Green New Deal and some sort of uh, considerations of its potential, but also concerns from a climate justice front. So, it's an ambitious agenda, but we're going to try to get to it. So I want to examine these two proposals uh, and these two narratives. So at first, we need to know uh, what they entail. And so those that are proponents of green growth basically advocate that we need to have um, economic growth and that that's crucial to financing the energy transition. And so oftentimes, you might see folks that are promoting, for example, the Green New Deal as toting an advantage right, to the Green New Deal is that it allows this coordinated sort of overhaul and helps finance a large scale transition of the energy system. So a lot of folks will say, well, a Green New Deal is justifiable because it has the potential to stimulate growth in the right way, to stimulate growth that gets us away from um, emissions. The degrowth folks, and I am somewhat generalizing, but these are some of the main features that come up in these camps of views. 
uh, is emerging and it is a field of economic research. But an important point that they often make in this work is that these views were mobilized from the grassroots and from movements that have been advocating for social and environmental justice. Uh, both of these, to some extent, have. Um, the Green New Deal will also acknowledge its, its grassroots origins, but degrowth as an economic model also does. And the major kind of claim for degrowthers is this the idea that the growth of markets make it more difficult to accomplish emissions reductions. So growth is, to some extent, incompatible with moving and changing the energy grid. So arguments that emerge out of degrowth is this argument for reducing the scale of energy use in order to enable rapid energy transitions. OK? And so these two narratives actually have points of agreement that we want to uh, kind of put forward before we start kind of entangling and, and looking at uh, the differences between them. And that both proponents of green growth and degrowth do think that public investments are important for financing the energy transition. They also think that industrial policies are going to be needed to decarbonize the economy. So you are going to need this kind of shift in the policy making. They also agree that we need to socialize the energy sector to allow for longer investments. And doing so might entail an expansion of the welfare state. So we need to increase certain kinds of social protections, maybe that don't seem explicitly connected to the energy transition, because those are going to be necessary and helpful to enable both adaptation efforts and to you know, account for certain kinds of costs in the transition. So these are things to keep in mind in the background, that they are working towards a similar projects in one sense. But there are certain fundamental points that bring up tension between these two strategies. So um, in order to kind of pull out those tensions, I want to talk a little bit about the Green New Deal. And so and that's going to, in a discussion about the Green New Deal, we'll hopefully point out both the potential of a Green New Deal, what that should look like, but also to bring out the points of friction and overlap between these two major frameworks that we're talking about. So some Green New Deal advocates, as I mentioned, maintain that investments in renewables are actually going to grow certain kinds of related activities that are going to stimulate the economy. So these kinds of views see that economic growth are going to increase revenues that are going to be made available for clean energy investments. And so the idea is that's actually going to accelerate deployment of these renewable energies. So that's how we might understand green growth, right? That's another way to frame green growth just in terms of some proponents of the Green New Deal. So I'll repeat that again. You're going to need certain kinds of stimulation to the economy, and that economic growth is going to increase the revenues that make the energy transition uh, be able to be accelerated and facilitated, right, through these kinds of investments. The degrowth folks, are going to disagree. And they're going to say, well, instead, the slower the rate of economic growth, the easier it's actually going to be to achieve emissions reductions. That seems, OK, now counterintuitive, right? Because you're literally seeing almost the opposite of the argument that we just entertained. Why is that? Well, because those that are taking this sort of degrowth approach see that the rate of change of carbon emissions is roughly equal to the rate of change of output times the rate of change of carbon intensity. So just to put that in like plain English, if we were to rely, the degrowth folks argue, on GDP growth to finance deployment of renewable energy, we're going to see, and that would mean increasing the total energy demand. And that increase in total energy demand makes emissions reductions harder to achieve. So an important, just easy line to remember, it's in the name, is that degrowthers will see growth as actually an impediment to achieving the energy transition, in part because it's going to increase total energy demand in virtue of this increase in production right, and rise of GDP. So why am I talking about the Green New Deal to kind of adjudicate these differences and these approaches? Well, an interesting thing about certain, and I'm using Green New Deal loosely here. I'm going to talk about it both as like a conception and something that you're seeing take up 
you know, in a global conversations, but then I will also talk to more like domestic iterations of the Green New Deal. And an important note to make is that uh, many of the sort of, um, uh, I guess, language of the Green New Deal has been, you know, meshed into Build Back Better, but <laughs> Build Back Better uh, was probably a less politically triggering term than Green New Deal, but that, that is sort of the like current iteration, right, that we're seeing right now. So why talk about the Green New Deal in this conversation? Well, it's interesting because a lot of approaches that are sort of facilitated by Green New Deal frameworks have an increasing openness to anti-growth and anti-capitalist ideas. So you'll see that there is at least a conversation that the Green New Deal proposals have that speak to some of the hindrances and obstacles just you know, capitalism offers with regards to addressing climate crisis. And so the tendencies in Green New Deal kind of proposals open up this potential for convergence with the degrowth narratives because they may share this kind of similar critique, right, of, of you know, unfettered capitalism. Domestically, we've seen how just even discussions and language over the past few years of the Green New Deal has altered conversations on how to deal with climate change. And a key point that I want to make about where these altered sort of narrative frameworks from a Green New Deal have emerged is not only to focus on the climate crisis as a crisis to be managed, but rather as an opportunity to ask ourselves, what does a just society look like? And so many of the narratives that emerged out of these discussions of the Green New Deal, at least domestically, are prompting us to consider sort of a wider framework of what kinds of things we want in a just society. And as we move towards an energy transition, we should be addressing and folding things into uh, the, the conversation and into policy. Another feature of the Green New Deal that's helpful in understanding degrowth versus green growth is that it has emerged in part out of grassroots. So it's not framing itself as some technocratic exercise, some top-down policy initiatives, right? It's seeing as you know, a, a collaboration between, for example, proposals that have come out of the Sunrise Movement along with progressive politicians, et cetera. So it's not just seen as like, you know, government solution to be imposed, but to be informed by grassroots movements. And so things that we should think about are all of these uh, in the column right here of changing the discussion enable some sort of fruitful way to engage with these different frameworks. So I just mentioned, but that there is a kind of compatibility if you understand Green New Deal frameworks as being at least critiquing, for example, a certain kind of hyper-focus on growth in terms of GDP. And that Green New Deal plans, even if they do embed green growth initiatives inside of them, they can be agnostic about what they mean by growth. So to be more clear, it's not that Green New Deal proposals inherently are going to sneak in green growth or are going to be necessarily degrowth. It's that they have the potential, they don't have as a necessary condition a fixed idea about what growth means. And this is something that we're going to hopefully get to by the end of the lecture, that there are other ways of reconceptualizing growth that maybe don't require, for example, a complete rejection of capitalism, but make us think about what is valuable and that GDP is not necessarily the measure we want to look at in terms of growth right, <laughs> in the processes of, uh, of moving towards the energy transition. That being said, there still is a kind of tension, right, even within a Green New Deal proposal. And that's really on what the long-term commitments for the social order are. So does the Green New Deal commit to, like, an anti-capitalist agenda in the long run? It's an open question, but if you look at most of the frameworks, probably not. Whether degrowth agendas, for the most part, are talking about the unsustainability of capitalism as a framework, period. And that they also could you know, just give very nuanced different answers to the question of like whether capitalism should be undone or what does that look like. So these are all kind of open questions um, for debate. One thing that I want to focus on is that there is a question about both the sort of narrative framework that the Green New Deal can bring up on the table, 
but also these questions of implementation and what it looks like in practice. And there are considerations of justice and morality that folks, especially researchers um, that come out of decolonial studies and, and philosophers that are working on climate justice, want to bring up. So I'm going to raise a few concerns, some moral considerations and, and considerations of justice about Green New Deal policies that don't think that they're inherently <laughs> at risk of being unjust, but to raise questions of what just implementation would look like. And so this comes out of uh, some of the reading that you did um, by Olufemi Otaiwo, professor at Georgetown. And that article raises the question, can the Green New Deal exacerbate climate colonialism? Like, is it uh, inherently protected from doing these kinds of unjust, harmful, oppressive uh, you know, um, practices? Or do we need to do something in building in the implementation and the framing of them to guard against that? And so not to assume that we all know what climate colonialism is, I wanted to just talk about different ways in which that term's referred. And I'm gonna utilize uh, Professor Taiwo's understanding in the rest of kind of explaining um, questions about justice with regards to the Green New Deal. But here are three different ways to understand climate colonialism that come out of this literature. Um, one is that it's the idea of a domination of less powerful countries and people through initiatives intended to slow global warming, so that you're going to see the continuation of this power dominance through climate policies. The second understanding, which is how I'm going to be referring to it in this lecture, is this idea that climate colonialism amounts to deepening or expanding foreign domination through climate initiatives that exploit poorer nations via their resources or they somehow compromise the sovereignty of these foreign nations. There's other ways that it's referred to, I put on this slide, where they, folks see climate colonialism, understanding it as how formally colonized countries are paying the price for the most part of the climate crisis, which has been caused disproportionately by emitters uh, from industrialized countries, and those countries tend to be current and past colonizers. So we're gonna kind of focus on this idea of if the Green New Deal wants to avoid perpetuating climate colonialism, it should avoid doing the kinds of things that, for example, deepen or expand foreign domination through our climate policy. So that's what we want to look at. So I want to look a little bit closely at like some examples of climate colonialism uh, just briefly in order to show how those might manifest in a Green New Deal so we can see how we might want to avoid those. So one example, right, we can just pull from like common forms of colonialism through like, right, unjustified land occupation or overt foreign influence and control, right, that uh, compromises the sovereignty, right, of an occupied territory or an occupied peoples. And while Green New Deal policies could empower communities, like let's say on both sides of the US uh, border, and it also could expand the power of poor nations to determine their own destinies, that's not necessarily the case. We have to be really explicit on how that's going to be implemented and how that's going to be done by design. So for example, a Green New Deal could not, for example, be just, may not meet the requirements of climate justice, if it's used, for example, as an industrial policy that would continue these legacies of oppression. So we might have to avoid doing certain things. For example, if you take, uh, in, you know, in the 19th century, the development of the transcontinental railway system here in the US, the federal government gave lands to rail companies that it just took, right, from Native American peoples here through a series of uh, coerced treaties and wars. So we can see these kinds of illegitimate land grabs that helped to develop you know, important infrastructure in the country. So obviously, like, not a just transition with regards to the development of that infrastructure. Similarly, to address climate change, we're going to need large tracts of land. We've already been talking about, for example, the importance of addressing the food crisis, for example, in this class. And we're going to need particular kinds of policies that help us in the transition. And so this worry, again, about another form of a land rush or a land grab is not only a future concern, it's actually already happening, right, with the justification that this is important for climate change. 
So you can take, for example, I'll give you an example of this, um, the, you know, the need for doing carbon offsets. So we've talked a little bit about carbon offsets in here, but this idea is that it's a form of investment in greenhouse gas emissions reductions that lets the buyer offset you know, the effect of their emissions so private companies can, can justify their continual uh, emissions of fossil fuels. So much of the available land that's used in these kind of carbon offset programs is located in poor countries where people have less political power. So it puts land use that would otherwise be used for basic resources for people, you know, these populations in these countries, in competition with powerful private interests of the world's powerful private countries where these industries, right, are located for. And when you have that kind of power inequality and that need for this kind of competing limited land space, you might assume what's going to win out. So there's a you know example that's used uh, in the article that I wanted to highlight where Norwegian companies are buying and conserving forest land in East Africa for carbon offsets. So this is seen as like you know a, a justifiable uh, need in addressing climate change. But to get that land, what was done was uh, forcibly evicting thousands of Ugandans, Tanzanians and Mozambicans, and that also prompted food scarcity in these regions. So think about the railroad example, right, and now this kind of current example, um, as seeing this reified form of colonialism with climate change as the justification for it. Another, so in, in answering this question of how can the Green New Deal be just, we need to be thinking about these legacies of oppression and avoid, for, avoid forms of colonialism uh, that we're seeing in these various ways. So another example, for example, you know, that I'm kind of mentioning or gesturing towards is this idea of boosting energy security. So for example, the African continent has, has you know, the world's largest solar plant right now in Morocco. And it has one of the largest populations of people that are least connected to the energy grid. So there's already this kind of like, you know, issue that's arising in this case. So even if the presence of solar power there uh, offers the opportunity to give Africans more access to electricity, there is built in already to some of these frameworks this idea that that energy is going to be offshored to Europe. And so we're seeing that having land in Africa, right, with being used for like production of solar energy, you don't see the energy in connection to the grid happening in the areas where that land use is happening. You're seeing it. Um, be offshored. So that land use and the kind of costs that come with that might still leave millions of uh, folks in sub-Saharan Africa without energy access. So you might be able to see this as a form of energy exploitation, but justified under maybe a Green New Deal looking kind of policy. Um, this is happening locally, in case there, you want to kind of see it on a domestic example. Um, California is already importing electricity, solar electricity from Baja. Uh, and, you know, I'm from there, so this is, you know, just a local example that I had. And businesses are pointing to actually expand cross-border grid links to Central America. So while, again, that might not be inherently unjust or problematic, there are major risks, right, to depriving folks in the places where we're doing this kind of cross-border grid linking. So that's something to consider. And so those are kind of the concerns I have in yellow here. Um, again, these aren't inevitable. So you can make certain kinds of policies more just. How I, we do that on a Green New Deal framework? Well, we're going to need to see the way that costs of technology that reduce carbon emissions can be brought down to the point that that clean tech is the cheapest way to provide energy, food, and transportation, and that it can be then available globally, right? So, investing in R&D in the states, right, to make these kinds of technologies accessible, make it like the option of choice then for everybody else, since the cheapest will likely be, you know, the one that's adopted. And this is coming out of the arguments, right, that you were reading. Um, we need incentives to scale deployment. And you need to subsidize renewables, right? Um, so that can help make this green tech irresistible. And there's some examples I can give you briefly. Germany has kind of led by example in this way, um, given the way that they've subsidized solar and wind energy. So subsidized solar and wind uh, were happening when those industries were really small scale and costs were really high. 
And with those subsidies, that helped German utilities and businesses and homeowners purchase clean energy. That created a market which led solar and wind manufacturers to jump into the market, increasing competitions and bringing price downs. And we've talked about this right in this class. Professor Pakala has shown you how increasingly cheap these things have become. So I don't want to go on about it too much, but we see you know, the cost of electricity from solar drop by like 30%. Um, every time we see this kind of uh, doubling in scale. So solar is cheap now, uh, more cheap than building new fossil fuel plants like in India, Chile, Mexico, Spain, and also in states here, mostly sunny states, right, like Arizona and Nevada and Colorado and Texas. So that's one way, right, that can be considered. Uh, another kind of focus maybe then on, on this Green New Deal initiative would be to focus on the hardest climate problems, not necessarily the ones that garner the most attraction or attention. So like, we're all gonna talk about solar cars, but as you know from being in this class, uh, what about, instead of you know, just talking about EV, we wanna think about problems of like agriculture, right? And correlated the problems of deforestation and land use. So that needs to be of topic or embedded in, in these Green New Deal proposals. And another feature that folks argue that would make it salient and, and you know, possibly more just uh, is whether or not it's passable legislation. Again, that's not gonna make it inherently more just. In fact, we might be seeing evidence of making passable legislation um, that might hinder right, the just capacities of these policies, um, but it is a challenge that has to be taken up. So, before I spend too much time talking about Green New Deal stuff, I do want to talk specifically about and looking a little bit closer at, um, we've already seen some of these justice considerations, some other kinds of moral arguments that are at play, and whether or not we have certain kinds of alternatives, and then whether or not a Green New Deal can accommodate those alternatives. So I do want to turn a little bit to degrowth arguments to just flesh out a little bit more. I gave you the basic definition earlier on. But this is the idea that um, I think the, the one thing that you'll want to remember when trying to understand a green new or sorry a degrowth narrative is that we're not going to see <laughs> um, a green growth agenda decarbonize us quickly enough. So they're going to immediately critique right the the uh, green growth issue in terms of its capacity for addressing and getting to 1.5 right in, in the relevant timescales that we need. So we need more, what's entailed right, by this view is that we need more than accelerating economic activity to get less carbon over time. I'm gonna offer a technical term that I'm gonna to refer to, but this kind of claim we might see as what's called decoupling. So we have to decouple accelerated economic activity from less carbon emissions, right? So there's the idea that one doesn't entail the other. In fact, instead of going the decoupling route, what the green or sorry, the degrowth folks are saying is that we actually need to delink economic activity from carbon emissions, and we have to do so at a rapid pace to meet our targets. So, in the readings, um, Callis and Hickel, you know, uh, that I, I had you look at, you can see some of the arguments appear here. When the dominant kind of major claim here is that paths to current targets to 1.5, for example, become much more plausible if you assume lower growth rates in GDP. Because that's going to require less decarbonization. The demand on the use of renewables will be less, which actually allows us uh, to move quicker to get ourselves to scale. And so, for example, right, they'll, they'll bring up this kind of evidence that between 2005 and 2015, 18 developed economies reduced national emissions. And how did they do so? Well, they invested in renewables, right? So we're seeing that investment in technology. But they also reduced growth. And so they also then reduced energy demand. That's the kind of argument, right, that's coming out of these degrowth frameworks. And there are some estimates out there that if the global rate, so looking at GDP, across the world, if that's less than 0.45% per year, we have a chance of hitting the target of two degrees. So that's not even hitting 1.5 and still requiring a pretty large demand 
right, of, of degrowth, or at least um, a decrease in the global GDP growth. An underlying assumption that's built into these accounts is that uh, we don't have good reason to expect technology in the long run is going to help decouple perpetual growth from energy and resource use. So to be cheeky about it, technology is not going to save us. We shouldn't be relying on the fact that we will be able to get to scale quick enough um, by relying on any kind of green growth, because this decoupling is not going to get us there. Uh, in part, that assumption emerges uh, because of the way that they see uh, capitalism as being antithetical to any kind of sustainable progress. And so what are they asking or claiming or arguing that should be done? Well, they're saying that advanced countries, so countries in the, in, in the global north, should take active steps. This is there should be their number one priority, is take active steps to reduce energy and re reduce resource use that helps with GDP growth as quickly as possible. Like, that's where we should be concerning most of our efforts. And in the long run, that's because growth-oriented capitalism and economies relying on that model are unsustainable. So we ought to be moving away from this sort of thing. There are certain kinds of moral questions that arise in light of this, because, of course, this kind of model is going to also require costs to be considered. And so we might see some of these questions emerge. <clears throat> we might want to think about <laughs> what risks, here's a moral question, right, that we might ask ourselves uh, when we're thinking philosophically. What risks can be justifiably imposed for the, for the sake of some prospective social benefit. So in this case, the risks that we're thinking about are the climate risks that we can reduce by reducing growth in comparison to the gains in GDP, right, um, that we might get on a less cautious growth plan like a green growth program. So this raises right, further questions about should we gamble on green growth alone? And when I say should, I mean in a moral sense. Right, ought we? Not like, I don't know, should in any kind of specifically uh, another way, but I, I'm referring to it in a kind of a normative sense. Like, is it morally justifiable to gamble on green growth in light of the insights that degrowth arguments give us? Is there a more cautious alternative to us for us than green growth? The degrowthers are going to answer this question and say, yes, degrowth, right? Um, but this raises another question. Is degrowth the only solution? Are there other justifiable alternatives, given some of the costs that might come with degrowth, or even some feasibility constraints, and like you know having to answer questions of what like a non-capitalist goal looks like at the end of the day? Um, and so that brings up the sort of related question of whether the costs of degrowth are entirely morally justifiable. So these are some questions I'm, I'm putting forward that I think for the rest of the lecture we're going to be sort of interrogating. And I'm going to describe an alternative model called A-growth that seeks to try to um, show that there is an alternative to green growth, but also show that you can take some of the values that come out of the degrowth argument without requiring necessarily uh, sort of a rebuke of capitalism, but to reinterpret and re-understand what we mean when we're saying that we value growth. So this alternative, which is referred to as A growth, um, is going to show that uh, maybe there's a, a middle ground that takes the insights from, from both of these. So to get into a little bit about that, um, I want to like, you know, answer this, these questions about the degrowth model, if we were to take those alone. So things that reduce economic activity, an A growth model argues, are morally necessary. So, um, there is a kind of alliance with degrowth arguments that we ought to see a reduction in economic activity. And that, that reduction is morally required. But, the agrother might argue, we also have to account for what we owe to present people. And so there has to be some sort of improvement on the social compact, right? We have to see that there might be the possibility that green industry jobs 
will bring economic growth. And that we shouldn't then rebuke that. So we're not saying all growth is bad. And that instead we should use the kind of good growth to make up any kind of emissions deficits with further decoupling or degrowth measures. So just to put in more plain speak, we may need to have to accept certain kinds of acceleration of economic activity, contra the degrowth folks, to fulfill important social objectives to get to net zero on time. But doing so can bring in the kinds of things that degrowthers want, right? So that it's trying to have its cake to some extent and eat it to this kind of a model. So how it can do so, right, according to an A growther, is to understand that not all growth is inherently good. And so what it does here, and this is you know, some help that comes out of right, uh, philosophically minded folks. So some of these um, arguments emerge out of the work that Aaron James that you read had done and also some of the work that comes out of his collaboration with Bob Hockett, is that you offer different concepts that help to elucidate these kinds of um, different options that are available. In this case, that maybe measuring D GDP as what we consider the, th the sort of thing that is the barometer within which we're understanding growth happening is not the measure that we want to look at about what's morally salient and morally valuable. And so this is a quote I'm going to read that kind of tries to, um, I don't have it on the slide, but kind of tries to make this point. So James argues, being in attunement with the planet's dynamic systems and boundaries could ultimately require moving to a steady state or a low growth economy for the long run. So here's where you start seeing the agreement with degrowth stuff. But whether it requires a general degrowth depends on what technologies emerge and how we'll learn to segregate creating good stuff from creating bad stuff over the long run. So the point being here, we're going to leave it an open question that at certain times in this energy transition, we might see some growth is justifiable, but that we should understand that growth differently than GDP. So just merely seeing growth of GDP is not necessarily tracking what's morally justifiable. We want to see the increase and in growth of some good things and the, de the decrease of bad things, right? So we don't want to see the growth of certain bad things. And we might now talk a little bit about what we mean by good and bad. So in this argument, the A growth uh, argument says, look, Let's continue to do aggressive decoupling. So that's kind of what the green growth people argue, while also doing degrowth measures. So James, for example, argues uh, that we can do that by reducing the work week, particularly in developed nations or richer nations. So reducing the amount that people work is reducing the amount of potential emissions right, that are happening. And so some of these arguments are actually informed by what's been happening during COVID. Uh, and see that like maybe a couple of years ago, these kinds of arguments about like the reduced work week or whether we could ra like radically shift the way we work maybe wouldn't be seen as feasible. But James argues that given our experiences with COVID, we can see a rapid change in what work looks like, especially in countries like the US. So this, uh, you know, the feasibility frontier is actually a lot closer. And so um, on this kind of model, Slower GDP growth in advanced countries, so remember, uh, those that are in green growth are saying we need to increase GDP, that's going to help us with the energy transition. Degrowth folks are like, that's incompatible with the energy transition. The A growth argument goes, hey, well, actually, yay to slower GDP growth, and that's in fact morally justifiable, but I'm not being anti-growth in general. I'm understanding the growth good growth as something different. And so I want to look really quickly, and this is on this slide of the argument about why lower GDP growth is morally justifiable on these arguments. Oh, that's okay. I was, is that the like countdown to when you're ready to be done listening to me? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so on these kinds of moral arguments, it's the idea that um, the rich right, gain very little from increased economic growth in these countries. And you might think like, hey, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I'm still strapped, right, for cash and things like that. 
And the important thing to remember here is that um, most of the efforts that you do as a working person uh, to see national GDP increase, the majority of the benefits of that GDP increase go to the most wealthy. So this argument for moral justifiability of seeing decrease in GDP is that for the most part, the only people taking a cut when GDP goes down is like the uber rich. And so there's very little gain that comes from that kind of, of like facilitating that economic gain at the cost of moving towards uh, certain kinds of problematic, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emission kind of productions. These arguments also advance the fact that, like, well, what about, like, workers, right? And the kind of income that they would otherwise gain if they didn't have, let's say, a shortened work week. So let's say we move the work week down to 30 hours a week. God forbid, right? So there's this idea that, well, what's going to happen? People are working less. Maybe they're earning less money. And so these arguments assume that these kinds of things are morally justifiable, but they can't be done in a vacuum. You need a larger structure that's going to help prop them up. So for example, a universal basic income might be required to compensate folks. Similarly, you might think that compensation in this loss of wages could come with the fact that you're getting paid to stay home and not work because that's you, you know, global rich doing your job to address the climate crisis. So that kind of like increased uh, leisure time itself can be a reward or there could also be financial gain. So the, and, and on this argument, there's this you know, underlying argument that the gains to rich worlders, overall, if that's like a cost, right? The cost to those of us in the global north, at the end of the day, those gains count less morally than the benefits that we're going to see in terms of climate security and possibility for adaptation for those that are less well off, right? particularly those in the global south. But like I said, I want to emphasize these arguments can't succeed in a background. They require other kinds of practices. So that requires having a different kind of commitment to what the work week looks like, increasing more flexible work or part-time labor so that those that do want to work more can, but there are certain kinds of labor protections that enable that part-time labor um, to be facilitated. How? Well, you need to increase the social safety net, right? You need to have maybe basic income grants, or you might need to provide other sorts of things like decoupling healthcare from your job so that folks can be more picky and choosy with the amount of time they want to spend laboring. And if you read um, James's other book, Surfing with Sartre, he makes these kinds of arguments um, in light of the fact that uh, for the workaholic, this is not telling you, you you can't work more, like go for it. But those of us that are, this is me being cheeky, but you know, the arguments that he has is we're not going to like chain the workaholics at home and force them to do leisure. It's the idea that we're going to compensate those of us that are not workaholics so we can, over the aggregate, have this kind of reduction in, in work that contributes to um, maybe problematic production. And in fact, an important point about this is <laughs> this is not saying that us in, the, us in the global north need to like sit back and not work as much as we're trying to get towards 1.5. It's in fact that we might need to see concentrated increase in jobs and efforts towards green transitions, and that's where we should be focusing the labor, right? So it's not an argument overall of like, let's work less. It's like, let's change the way that we're working uh, and, and help this um, transition along. And so this is not an argument to detach from capitalism right, in the way that the degrowth folks are arguing. So here's where there's a distinction with this A growth model. And it's an argument for what James argues is leisure capitalism. And he thinks that these things, like if, if you're going to have this kind of a framework, you need to reinterpret what we mean by capitalism. And so I'm using these words. They are you know, triggers. <laughs> they come with all sorts of like social conceptions. Um, and it's important to understand that as people are developing these kinds of frameworks, they're stipulating new ways or different kinds of definitions to attach to these kind of well-worn concepts. And so that's like, this is an example of that, which is to say that, let's say on this A growth model, the goal is not abolish capitalism in the sense that the degrowthers are arguing, but rather to bring about a different kind of capitalism, but understood in this kind of limited way. 
which is like, yes, there's still a reliance on markets, and there's still private financial markets. But, and those markets, um, they have to be contextualized some way. So they're embedded within a democratic republic. So it's that kind of you know, democratic system that's going to uphold formal and substantive equality among citizens on their you know, major sets of rights, basic civil, political, and economic rights. So you can't have this reliance on markets that compromises these things. So what a leisure capitalist model would have this is constrained and embedded within that. Also that government is responsible for issuing and managing public money by public central banks. So this is an important point. It comes up in the Money for Nothing book that I gave you the chapter for, where the, you know, James and, and um, Hockett argue that for states that have economic or monetary sovereignty, they're able to produce and borrow from their own money, right, production. That the way that um, you can invest in these kinds of transitions, right, is to be able to print and borrow money against the government. And you're going to manage this sort of thing through a public central bank and running public or maybe quasi-public payments in the banking system. And if you're interested in this kind of model, they go on in detail about how you shouldn't really be worried about the boogeyman of inflation on these kinds of schemes that you often hear. Again, like I mentioned before and something that I'm going to keep stressing, this kind of model would require robust social insurance programs, health care, and access to public goods that are provided by um, you know, uh, the government. Also, this kind of framework would organize productive relationships by principles of time efficiency. And this is important, right, for climate. So the productivity improvements are not about increasing GDP. They're instead measuring whether there is a growth in certain kinds of standards of living. And that helps to be something that uh, we're going to enable a kind of systematic freeing up, for example, of certain things like time to achieve the same or slightly raising the level of material wealth. So this is a way to focus on alternatives. What good growth requires is focusing on other metrics beyond GDP. Are we doing better <laughs> in terms of standards of living? And let's increase the kinds of things that allow for that to happen. And so this might involve certain kinds of tactics, like I said, of shortening the work week, providing generous uh, compensated vacations. And we can do so, again, remember on these arguments, it's morally justifiable even when you have opportunity costs of gaining greater material wealth. So if it's between like increasing overall greater material wealth, again, remember, we're not focusing on those metrics anymore as signs of like a healthy and just society. We're focusing on other kinds of things. And of course, this is going to require necessary technologies right, that we've been talking about in here. But it's not going to gamble whether or not these technologies are going to manifest like the degrowth arguments might be risking. So if you remember that moral question about risk, degrowth to some extent, and maybe some of the green growth arguments rely on certain kinds of technologies manifesting. On this view, there's the idea that not only do you need the technology, but you need regulation, certain kinds of practices, and other kinds of mechanisms maybe like circular economies or economic and social systems that can get us ecologically attuned. So this is not going to be sort of a silver bullet solution, but it's going to need to con come in conjunction of certain things. So that's why I had you take a look at like donut economics. As in, this is an example of you know, circular economy stuff that could be embedded or could be compatible with this other kind of framework. So, just, you know, you can take a look at this last slide. I, I have a couple minutes, so I just want to make the point that, or one minute, that um, an A growth model tries to walk the balance, right? It's not necessarily saying that degrowth alone is going to give us the solution, but it's wanting to involve principles that emerge out of degrowth. But it's also not saying, well, <laughs> we need an entirely green growth model. It's going to agree with degrowth that growth-focused capitalism is ecologically unsustainable. It agrees on that point. But we need to think about growth and other measures, like I've been saying, beyond GDP. And so these are questions to ask yourself as you, you know, examine all these different models. Are these things credible over the long term? Are these workable, lasting solutions? 
James et al. are going to argue that this model is, and you can look more in depth at some of those arguments. Um, but, but there are these moral questions, right, that are entailed in examining all of these. So hopefully that gave you kind of an overview and more questions to investigate as you hear about these proposals coming on uh, in the future. So thanks so much.